yeah, so we're working today on implementing like some kind of isometric renderer, um, which is a a type of like orthographic projection, which means that there's no like vanishing point. Things which are further away don't get smaller. Like every grid cell in the world is kind of exactly the same size, no matter where it is. Um, you know, old games used use this style because it allowed them to have like a 3D. Oh, this is a really like simple good example actually. It allowed them to have a 3D seeming world without having to do real. 3D graphics. Um, in the era of modern graphics cards, we could actually cheat. We could just set up a scene with our camera and the camera settings such that it looks like this and just draw it and render it like any old like regular 3D game scene. But I feel like that's cheating. I, I kind of want to do it the way they had to back in the day, which was normally these were like sprite based games. So they probably had little images for all of these tiles and they do a bit of mapping to figure out where on screen those should be placed and you know in which order they should be drawn so you know things which are closer to you overlap things behind you and so on or things which are further away um yeah i've never actually done this before i don't think i've ever implemented an isometric grid and one of the reasons behind that is that it's it's actually kind of fiddly to do in terms of okay so in the normal tile based game you'd have your kind of X coordinates going like left to right and your Y coordinates going top to bottom. And given the kind of coordinates of any cell in the world, you could very easily tell where it should go on screen because you're just kind of looking at things front on. Whereas with isometric things, the grid is like not aligned with the screen, right? You've got this weird kind of angle which everything's skewed off to. So you have to do a bit of mapping between the, the kind of coordinates in your world to the on-screen coordinates. And that can get a little bit well, I kind of assume that can get a little bit fiddly uh, to do. So what I ultimately want to be able to do, get my little sketch out here, is to have a world defined like just in a grid. So in our computer's memory, we're basically just going to have like a 2D array or something like that, which kind of represents the world. And then maybe different types of tiles. So you could have like ground and water or, you know, whatever makes sense kind of in your game. But, you know, maybe this is like tiles of a certain type. So type one. Then maybe have a little path of type two. Kind of running through that. You know, maybe this is like a river running through the world or something. And we want to ultimately transform that to this isometric perspective where the world kind of looks like something like this instead, right? Excuse my slightly skewed and squiffy representation. Immediately I'm trying to figure out like where this tile goes, right? Is it here or is it? here it's not totally obvious because i think of this as like x axis and this is y but immediately i'm kind of thrown off um i feel like you have to somewhat arbitrarily decide you know maybe say this is x and then this is y i'm sure there's a convention or like a standard way to do it and it kind of makes sense to me that like the zero zero point is probably going to be like right in the middle at the top but it could equally be here right and x could kind of go this way and y could go that way but yeah you kind of have to choose one i guess and stick with it so i'm going to go like one it's like this kind of arrangement so where i'd love to be able to get to in this stream is to be able to define an array like this and then be able to render given some little tile graphics you know maybe they even have some interesting like little depth bit of depth for them or like kind of stuff drawn on top who knows uh, I want to be able to render this kind of world like this yeah stretch goal if we can do it is to be able to hover our mouse over this world and figure out which tile we're we have the mouse hovered over because again in a normal 2d world this is really super simple because everything's 
kind of bracketed in like a square box so the mouse coordinates very cleanly mapped to these tiles whereas in this situation it's a bit messy right like maybe i can figure out that the mouse is over this area but then do i know if it's in this tile or this tile or this tile or this tile or this tile there's some uh sort of mapping world space to screen space mapping if you like which needs to go on here um yeah and i don't actually know off the top of my head how this is done so maybe i should google right i'll bust out wikipedia to see <laughs> what it's got to say oh i want to do this as well not by drawing lines but by actually placing down pre-created tile graphics so i'm going to try and find some graphics we can use my go-to site for this is open game art org which is mostly creative commons or free under various like free or free-ish licenses you can find all sorts of artwork i'm just going to kind of search isometric and see if we can get some kind of tile set which we like you can chat by the way if you spot anything you like to look over let me know and we can maybe go with it oh this is cool so this person kenny releases loads and loads of public domain assets and they're all really good they all have this same kind of like um vectory smooth style um i don't know part of me thinks since this is a really old school graphical style maybe we should not maybe we should go for pixel art but these are pretty nice as well we could also have like high definition uh, isometric stuff if we wanted i'm gonna call this one a maybe because i do like that so let's see what else we have look like just some objects here Okay, no, I think these are just trees and stuff. I we really want some like ground tiles. The other thing, by the way, is if if these things have, uh, if these are purely just flat tiles like the little diamond shape, then we can draw them on screen in any order and it'll work. But if they have some substance to them, like some three Dness to them, if they're not just totally flat floor tiles, then we need to be careful to kind of draw them. If you think about it, we'd want to draw this one first and then this one after, right? Because if we, assuming these things were like right up against each other, because this one is kind of closer and so should appear, if you like, on top of this one. If you drew them the other way around, then this would like, they'd overlap in the wrong way. You kind of see that here, right? How this near one is like visually on top of this slightly further one. So there's a bit of logic there we'll need to do as well. Here's some basic tiles. Tower defense tiles. You know what? I'm just going to go with these, these Kenny assets, actually, if nobody has any major objections to that. This seems pretty reasonable to me. Let's open this thing up. Appears to have it in a sprite sheet form. Oh, this already looks messy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so look at this. So when I think of a sprite sheet, I normally think of things in a nice orderly grid, but look at this, right? Like these don't really line up in, in a really nice way. Um, so even how exactly you'd want to store these things on a sprite sheet is to me not 100% clear even so you'd probably want them to have enough padding around them like to fit the biggest object in here like this one sticks up a load and it's screwed up the alignment of this whole row so you can't even crop out a nice rectangle on a regular grid to pull these things out so maybe for the sake of sanity i'll pick tiles which are all like this sort of size maybe and maybe what we can aim to do first off is like uh yeah like our little sketch here if this is like a river and then these are bits of grass then maybe we can take some appropriate like rivery tiles and some bends and some like plain grass and then stick those together putting slopes in different terrain levels would be another level of complexity which i think we can uh 
safely safely put off for this stream. Yeah, so I think what I'll do is I will just maybe oh, actually take this out of the zip file it's in. So it's working on the other screen here to open this. Okay, boom. Here is our thing. So what kind of tiles are we going to need? Thinking like this one, and then enough like rivery pieces to create this kind of curve. So what size even are these? You can see down there the size is 133 by 99, which seems like a horrible <laughs> size for a tile. Um, let's turn the grid on, let's see if that... really is the size of this grid. Um, Okay, straight away, things are not aligned all that nicely for us. Okay, what I may do is this thing also contains some like separate, uh, like the images in a separate, like all separated out. So I have this folder here with all of these things, so I'm probably just going to use these whatever ones of these we actually need. So let's go through and note down. Probably don't want that. Nope. Let me reorganize this slightly. Okay, that note. That's not what we want because it kind of rolls off like a waterfall. So many pieces. <laughs> Check the sheet again. Does it even have what I'm looking for? Yeah, I'm kind of wondering now what, how this one would like overlay. Place next to another. have to join up like this. Yeah, there's a weird like gap there that they don't quite marry up. So... Okay, these look nicer. The water goes all the way to the end. Okay, so I may need the ones with the little concrete dealies. Oh, Kenny, why is your pack kind of weirdly organized? Okay, no, actually, the, these will do just fine as well. Okay, I'm just going to keep going through. Seems like they are in there. There's just so many of these. Okay, this is good. 64, we like that one. Sixty-five. Okay, that's good as well. Just plain grass tile. Okay, this is also good. And this. And 78. 79. Maybe we'll pull in some more in the future, but is that everything? Maybe it, you know. Okay, let's pull these out. 
and we're going to drop them into our folder for this project. So we're using processing for this, as we generally do. So assets should be in a data folder. Now I kind of want to name these in a way that makes sense to me. So we'll call that... What do I even call this? Okay. It's kind of going up and to the right. It's not up right, it's up and to the right. This is just grass. But even like how you would organize these into a sprite sheet and how you would index and refer to them is like not the most obvious thing to me. Um. So I'm kind of thinking that in a real game you might even want to allow the camera to rotate, which would mean you would need um, to pick a different tile depending on the camera perspective to get the these angles to kind of line up right, because you can't really rotate these in any meaningful way. Like the shading is coming from a particular direction and stuff. Uh, You know what, I feel like I'm missing one with a curve, uh, a river thing with a curve at the top. So let me go through these quickly again. You ever play Carcassonne? It really reminds me of that. You could even implement Carcassonne with this kind of rendering style. Okay, tangent, let's look at Carcassonne. So this is a tile placing board game where you place down uh, these tiles to make a kind of city layout and they all have these little bits of road and like curvy rivers and stuff like that. So I can imagine you making a game like that with this isometric rendering style could be quite nice. But today I'll be happy if I just can draw my little river scene. So I kind of want like this, but with the other bit of grass bank on the other side as well. The counterpart to that. Come on, Kenny, I know it's in here. There we go, okay, 86. Kenny okay, didn't fail me after all, although I'm not a huge fan of this ordering, okay. Um, okay, awesome. So we now have these things available. Let's try and load one in and just draw it on screen. So we're using processing for this, and this has two main functions. It has a setup function at the start of the program, reset the size of the screen. Let's just do 800 by 800. Again, as always, I just use the 3D render all the time, even though we're just going to be doing some 2D rendering stuff here. And let's create a little, um, a little lookup table of our tile types, I think. So um, okay, this with an array. How do I want to do this? So I'm going 
gonna need this. Let's pull up our actual file names here. Ah. Us. Okay, those are our tile assets. Tile images, and then I want to kind of have corresponding images kind of loaded in for those. Hmm, this whole thing may have been kind of unnecessary. Okay, so. load these all in like this. Yeah, this probably was. Um, you know what, do it this way. for all of these and load in the corresponding image files. Using this handy load image function, and it's just going to be plus PNG. Okay, that's loaded. So hopefully those are all loaded in. Uh, the other function processing is a, a, something called draw, where we would generally pr probably will clear the screen. So use the background thing for that. And then let's just try drawing one of these things at like an arbitrary position. So let's say I have to choose an image mode. Basically, we get to choose whether we draw images by specifying where their top left corner is or where their center is. I feel like often I would use top left, but imagine this case where we have things of like different size and different height. What might make sense is to, as long as we keep these... Okay, so what I'm thinking is these have like a natural... Ah, why can't I draw anything? No idea what's happening there. That's probably the wrong size. Okay, these things have like a natural base where they, like logically the tile actually sits, right? And it's this kind of little thing here. I feel like if we always like center this and crop it so that this point is centered, then even if these things are different sizes, you know, even if you're dealing with like this guy over here, that was terrible. As long as the image is cropped with that point, like in the center of the crop, then we can place these in a, in a standard way and it will kind of account for the different heights of these things. That's probably very inefficient and we should pack them nicely in a sprite sheet like this, but uh, that's not a form of torture I feel like putting myself through today. So I'm gonna just gonna draw these on their center. So for example, I can say, let's draw like the third tile image at 100, 100. And then hopefully we'll see something sensible here. Okay, we have a tile drawn. Now, essentially what we're trying to figure out is where exactly we should draw the next tile, right? So. We could try and do this by trial and error. I'll, I'll figure out a slightly cleaner way to do this afterwards, but we know it's going to be like something to the right and something down. 
So, you know, we could guess it's like 150 and like 130. This is going to be wrong. But it's, oh, actually pretty close. <laughs> um, yeah, I was talking before about the order in which we draw these things. So, for example, if I was to reorder these two lines, then it will look totally wrong because they'll get drawn kind of one on top of the other in a way that doesn't make sense, right? Um, so basically, if we want to draw this grid, we kind of need to figure out, as we increase our x-coordinate, what does that actually correspond to in terms of the screen? And normally, increasing the x-coordinate in the world, if this is coordinate 0 and this is coordinate 1, um, it would correspond to just an x offset by the size of the tile, right? So uh, in this sort of grid situation, if we know that this top left thing has the coordinate, like zero, wrong tool. <laughs> if you know that this one has the coordinate like zero, zero, like right here, and this next one has the coordinate one, zero, and this one here has the coordinate row one then figuring out how to draw these on screen is just a matter of finding like this distance right between the center of one tile and the center of the next you just step along by that distance each time and you can kind of draw the world whereas in this situation stepping across increasing our x coordinate from zero you know, zero one two three zero one two, three. Increasing our x coordinate actually offsets us by this amount in the x and then this amount in the y, right, to get from tile zero to tile one. So that kind of step is going to become important. And what's really kind of weird and interesting is that if we step in the x and the y, then we step from here and then we step here and we end up lined back up in x coordinates because these things kind of cancel each out somehow. So I think a sensible way to do this is to store a stride, an x stride, meaning every time the x coordinate increases, we're going to add some vector to the tile's position. So that if we zoom in on a section of this, we have these. Oh, drawing grids is hard enough. Drawing isometric grids is. Terrible. Okay, so if if we're if the, and okay, if this is x direction, and this is y direction. As our x coordinate increases by one, we're going to need to offset by this particular vector here. And if our y coordinate increases by one, we're going to offset by this particular vector. And I'm going to call this thing the x stride. or X offset. So, okay, stride is a kind of technical term that's used in this sort of context, but it's probably not actually accurate to use it here, but I'm gonna use it anyway. It's the amount you kind of, as you increase in X, you stride along by a certain amount. And this is gonna be the Y. Stride, wow. Yeah, so we can, given a coordinate, so let's say, so the tile at, Tile at x, y. And this is the world position, like the logical grid position. It's going to be at a screen position of x times. Okay, let's do a dot. There's a way to do times x times x stride. plus y times y stride. So hopefully that makes sense. What it means is, yeah, for the x-coordinate, we'll step along like in this way as far as is necessary, and then the y-coordinate will do the same. So if there's some combination of x and y, if it's like x is 2, y is 1, then we're going to go one stride this way. 
another stride this way and then the Y stride added on and it kind of gives us the appropriate position for that tile. Um, in terms of what those strides actually are, I can probably just, got to be a better way to do this, but I'm leaning towards just like measuring it out of this image. Let's see what we can do. So actually going to be half of this width and then half of this height. So what we really care about is the size of this like top top dealy. It's made a bit hard because there's some like fuzzy edges on this thing. But if the actual size of our little diamond, if you like, is 130 by 65. See that appearing down in the bottom info bar down here. Then, okay, what do we know? So we know that our tiles are like this draw another one next to it we know that this is 130 we know that this is 65. So the X stride is going to be we're going to go from here to here. So we know the X there is uh, actually just 130, right? It's the same distance, the width of this tile. It, it's kind of lining up with the same point in the next tile, so it's going to be 130. And this is Rather than the whole height of the tile, this is like half the height of the tile. So it's going to be then 65 over 2. So, and then the Y stride is going to be similar, except it's going to be negative 130. So I'm just going to define these up here as constants. stride is going to be very similar. So let's give ourselves a little draw tile function. Draw tile, a type at a certain x coordinate, at a certain y coordinate. So we know the screen position, if you like going to be based on this little formula here. So we add as many, we use x stride as many times as the x coordinate and y stride as many times as the y coordinate. So we can use some of the handy built-in vector stuff in processing to do this, I believe. So let's say x, okay, so it's going to be x dot malt, yeah, dot add. This will probably work. This is a little bit complicated, so let me break this out to be a little bit more explicit. X. The contribution of the X to the position is going to be this. The Y contribution, or X term, let's call it. Y term is going to be the same for Y. And the final screen position is just going to be Add. Oh, or you can uniquely say p vector dot add. So p vector has a load of these handy built-in functions, but sometimes when you, some of them where you call a function on a p vector object itself, you can be um, actually changing the contents of this original vector. Whereas the ones which are like static members of p vector are 
you know, they don't actually mutate any of these parameters. Like sometimes you've got a vector and you want to add something onto it and just update it. Whereas other times you want to do a calculation and store it in like a new result. So that's what we're doing here. So let's then just draw this. I think I've got an error here. I think so. The syntax highlighting is a bit janky. So we're going to draw an image. Um, and we're going to draw... Given the type ID, if you like, we're going to look up in this little array the specific image, which was previously loaded in setup from the corresponding file name. Then we're going to draw it at the X position and Y position. Boom, maybe that's it, right? So now let's change this code to something like draw a tile of type 4 at, let's say, 0, 0. And let's draw a tile of type 3 at 0. Let's draw a tile of type 1 at 0, 1. It's picking some random tile types here. So we should get a little, in a roundabout way, I've made a little 4 by 4 block here, right? We've got 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1. I've probably drawn these in the wrong order, but that's a problem we can tackle later. Okay can't see anything what is going on here so something's been drawn at uh, zero okay so first of all we probably want to offset this to like the center of the screen or something um so we'll wait to do this it's just to kind of move our virtual camera if you like Centered. Okay, it would appear that everything has been drawn on top of each other. If I comment out the last one, let me see a different image here. Yeah, you can sort of see how this bit of green is actually coming from a tile underneath, which has just been stacked. So something strange is happening. Oh, I bet this is changing X stride. I was just talking about how if you don't want to change these values, you shouldn't just call these on them. So what this mult probably does is it returns the result of multiplying x stride with x, but it also just like updates x stride with that result as well. So probably what we actually want is mult something more like this. Yeah, basically these ones which mutate directly these things can be useful when you don't want to create loads of extra variables and vectors which is a performance issue sometimes whereas to make this little equation super super clear I do just want to take it all out into its components and do it kind of long form okay hopefully this is okay mm, not quite so <laughs> bet I overlook something in this little calculation. Right, this isn't 130, it's also 130 over 2. Because <laughs> if I was to move this 130 across, it would kind of be like that. So yeah, we do actually want... It only moves over this amount. Bit of a brain fart there. Um, what I could probably also do is just avoid repeating myself here. You know, not the end of the world if I do, but it's hopefully more clear where these numbers come from now. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So, the one issue I can see is that these do not perfectly overlap. I'm probably off by like one pixel in the sizing of these things. 
Uh, that's easily enough fixable, I think. Uh, oh, I commented out this as well. So let's actually draw this here. Okay, there is our little crazy looking <laughs> illogical canal system world right now. Um, okay, let's, these are probably off slightly, so let me... Oh, I hate to do this. This does not feel the cleanest. Okay, there is, I don't know if you can see it on stream, there's some very slight issues like where these have overlapped with each other. Maybe I can figure out in Photoshop exactly how this should work. So let's make the image real big for a second. And then I'm going to duplicate this layer and I'm going to pay attention down here to how far I'm moving it to see if I can find the point where it exactly lines up. Assuming there is one, right? It may just not perfectly marry up. I'm just trying to look at this very slight difference in lightness here. 6432. You know what, 60, if it's going to be 6432, those nice round power of two numbers, that's almost certainly the right answer. <laughs> um, that just tends to be, you know, somebody making a sprite sheet would just use those dimensions naturally, so I'm going to assume that's correct. So I'm going to say this is 128 by 64, and that's probably as close as we are realistically going to get. You know, part of it's because this is not a really pixely art style. There are slight issues with how these things get blended, like right at the interface between them. But, you know, I'm happy with that. When you're zoomed out, you can't really tell. Okay, that actually went down. I was going to say surprisingly quickly, it's been almost an hour. So actually, we're probably right on track. Okay, what I'd now like to do is to be able to just specify a big array which contains the the world itself and then have that drawn rather than these like manual dealies down here. So let's create something. Just create a world like that. Then we can start to populate this. So I always look for nice ways in the source code to like align things so that I can just, it kind of looks like a grid in the code if that makes sense. So I feel like I can do something like, how do, is there a nice way to initialize a 2D array? Um, I wonder how this works. So I want to be able to like type out the numbers in a grid like form here. Let me. Let's see what the syntax is actually in Java. Okay, something like this. This is kind of how you do it. And that I think will allow me to do what I want. We have to nest these curly brackets. Oh, oh damn, there's far too many adverts here. Okay. Maybe I need Grammarly, but not want it right now. So, okay, let's just make this smaller to begin with. 4 by 4 Which means, I believe, we'll just be able to kind of put our world in like this. Um, let's just fill it with the grass to begin with. Yeah, this is what I kind of want to be able to do, to like visually draw the the world kind of in the code like this. I feel like that's kind of a more intuitive way to do it than just having these listed in a way that didn't like visually align, as you might expect. What's wrong with this? Oh, so don't even have to specify the size because it can infer it. Okay, awesome. What does that mean? Okay, whatever. Um, okay, that's our world defined, so now let's instead draw the world like this. So 
Just think about now the order in which we draw things, right? So... As our X... Okay, we obviously want to draw this tile uh, first. Because everything else is going to be like visually overlapping on top of it. Is there any precedence with X and Y? Can we just draw like in this fashion, right? Like drawing like this row and then the next row and then the next row. Does that do what we want? Or do we need to do like a, something more like... Do we need to do something more like draw this one, then 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 this one? Let's just do it in a simple way first. Okay, something also to bear in mind is that um, if we want this to like visually align and not be rotated with respect to how we draw it, then this is zero zero, this is zero one, right? No, this is one zero, in fact, because x is uh, this is x coordinate is one, right? If x is increasing in this direction, then y is kind of increasing down that way, down this way. So we actually need to index this. Uh, backwards, I believe. So, yeah, because if we did one coordinate one zero, it would actually get us. This would be one, and then this would be zero. Whereas for one zero, we actually kind of want this. So it's actually zero one in terms of indexing into this array, which is kind of kind of odd. But I think it will do what we need. Also, assuming the world is square here, so I could actually do like world. So that would kind of be more accurate because this world dot length will be essentially the number of rows. Hey, Malieve, how's it going? How are you feeling today? We are drawing some Qbert style, load runner style, isometric graphics right now. Do you play anything in this style, like any of the old tactics games, or I'm trying to think if anything really modern uses this that much? Just at the point where we can kind of define a world and then begin to draw it, so type in the tile, it's going to be Okay, tactics advance. Okay. Yeah, I never got in super into any of those games. I'll be honest, I actually don't really like playing games on this kind of grid. Um, because like depth perception gets weird, especially the games which have any the aesthetics are really cool, but as soon as you have like height differences in the terrain, it gets kind of weird and confusing and ambiguous, I find. Like this sort of thing, right? Like is this platform like aligned with this one or is this like one step lower than that it it's that's the stuff that always confused me um for flat things like it's all good but yeah yeah but i think it looks really cool i've just never actually implemented it Yeah, the other one was um oh Sonic the Sonic game, right? What was this called? Sonic 3D Blast, this one. <laughs> because you had to jump and do platforming in this sort of situation. And it got Yeah. <laughs> this looks really cool. So there's actually a YouTube channel called I believe it's called Coding Secrets and it's the guy behind Traveler's Tales games, who was one of the, basically the developer of a load of these games, including Sonic 3D Blast, posts 
yeah there you go like how all of this stuff was implemented so these this is really interesting if you're into like the old crazy technical hacks they had to do for like mostly genesis and like dreamcast era stuff <laughs> yeah definitely definitely check out uh coding secrets is that what it's called yeah really really interesting channel anyway we have almost we have almost drawn our world okay so we're able to look up the tile type and then we can just use our handy drawing function draw that tile type at x and y and now we should have a field full of grass or not grass rather it's whatever this thing is okay we should now figure out the actual map we want to draw so we were going for something like uh I should really erase a load of this stuff. We'll be going for like a river flowing around a corner like this with grass around it. So we can kind of figure out from that what the coordinates need to be. These are easy, like this is all grass, this is all grass, this is all grass. It's just making sure the our corners and river segments are like aligned properly. So we just fill out. The so grass is actually index zero. So let's put the grass in. And then we have our... Ah. This is what? I believe this is correct. River upright. I think it's this one. So then it turns the corner here and then it becomes this one. And then it's one of these curves. I'm just going to guess because I can, <laughs> cannot be bothered to conceptualize how this works spatially and how it aligns maybe i'll get lucky okay not okay not quite <laughs> something went kind of wrong there so okay these sections are fine our corner is totally back to front and then we've got bits of river here for no reason so let's get rid of that junky unnecessary river so we used number three which is curve at the top i guess it should actually be curve at the bottom and what do we have Boom! Success! <laughs> we managed to draw our world. Um, awesome. Okay, that's cool. Let's add a couple more interesting objects into this. So, we go back through here and try and find something that looks fun. It is beautiful. Okay, so this could be fun. Check that our height is handled correctly. So this is... Uh, let me find where this went without revealing my entire downloads folder to everyone. One second. <laughs> Okay, we are back. <laughs> Nothing too incriminating appeared there. Okay. What's that spike again? It was like. Appropriately high tension music for scrolling through a tile set. There we go. It is 36. I'm going to pull that one out. And then let's load that into our program. So call it the cone. And then we can put 
this cone somewhere. Um, uh, what's the index? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, so this is wrong. Um, and this is because of something I talked about before, where the size of these images isn't always exactly the same. So let me open up this cone image. Let me actually open up the original version of this. Yeah, so the issue is that these images aren't exactly the same size. And my... <laughs> yeah, this is how geometry works, right? Yeah. This is up to building regulations. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the issue is that we're kind of stamping these down based on like their central position. Um, whereas what I wanted to do is make sure that the uh, central point of these images you like is, if you like is always kind of aligned. So I'm just going to throw this on top. It should put it in the center by default. Make it. I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, and I'm just going to make the image way bigger. Make sure it's centered still. And then I'm just going to move this so that it kind of aligns. So it's, oh, as long as the kind of central points of these align, then we should be good. Should make this more visible, maybe even. Do something with the color so it stands out more. Ooh, okay, perfect. And get rid of our little guide. Okay, now so we should now have a situation where the center point of this, both of these images, corresponds to the same like position on the floor, if that makes sense. So they're both like centered in the same way. <laughs> which then hopefully means that our tiles line up properly cool almost almost <laughs> not quite am i like one pixel off here yeah maybe yeah. let's move that down Over right. Reload this. Okay. Lighting looks a little bit odd, but it does appear more or less to line up. Okay. All up to regulation, all looking good now. So what's the next step here? So I'd like to make a bigger world, and I do not want to be typing in the coordinates and tile types for all of these things um, myself. So what I would really like is um, a way to make a little world editor here. And I think we can maybe do this in like 30 minutes if I'm, if I'm smart about how I approach it. So the main issue is, let me screenshot this actually. So we can scribble on it. The main issue is how we can even interact with this thing. So in terms of how we would like highlight and select certain tiles. So we have a tile which is like this one here, right? There are three ways I can think of. Um, the first one is just to cheat and use a keyboard. <laughs> So just using my arrow keys to like, you know, step this little, have a little cursor and be able to step that around. Honestly, that would probably work just fine for like building this world. Um, but I feel like it's not really an interesting problem to solve. Yeah, I mean, cheating's fine. So, <laughs> so there's a, 
slightly less cheaty, but still kind of cheaty method. So I'll call it the kind of cheat method. Um, which would be okay, and then it's still like the real nice method. <laughs> not not a technical term. The real nice method is if my mouse is anywhere in this tile, then I should be able to like hover over and highlight this. The difficulty is even defining and calculating the exact position of this tile is not like super easy or convenient to do because it's got this weird squiffy angles and stuff going on. So that's the real nice thing, and I would honestly have to have a little think about the best way to do that without just setting up a load of overcomplicated projection matrix stuff. The kind of cheaty way is to is from the fact that I know the central position of this. So I could just do something like if you're hovering within a certain range of like the center point of one of these, then you'll hover the tile. Um Honestly, that probably works. I mean, if I hover here, it's not going to know where I am. Or maybe I just pick the closest one. It will act a little bit weird, like, you know, when you're like right here or something like that, it might think you're close to this tile when actually you're kind of still on this one, but you're closer to the center of that one. So that's the kind of cheaty method, um, which I'm not, I don't know. I feel a little bit dirty doing that, but honestly, it's going to be a rather practical way to do it. What would a real method look like? I feel like there's some issue where... Okay, given the center of this, I could probably figure out like a rectangle around it, like that. I feel like that's within my within my power to do. Um, the issue then is that these overlap, right? So you've got your other neighboring tile which actually kind of covers like this rectangle so there's this ambiguous little overlapping area um, and it's how you figure out you know which side of this line I'm on basically and therefore which of these specific tiles I should be associating the mouse with like given its exact position so I, I think I maybe have seen somebody do this whereby they actually used like an image. Okay, so if I'm in this area, which for the sake of argument, assume I can like figure out this rectangle, then there are five possibilities, right? I'm like in this section, this section, this section, this section, or this section. So one thing I c could do as a means of cheating, which I, I think I've seen someone do before, is to have a little reference image which kind of corresponds to that right whereby it would literally be a color-coded rectangular image where like that's ooh, where like that's one color that's another color you know, This is another color and so on, right? So like a little color coded image and then I could figure out where my mouse is on this image and then use this little lookup image, color coded lookup image to take the pixel line over and map that to uh, one of these tiles. In practice, that's probably the easiest way to do this and the most convenient way without getting into any real gnarly mathematics to do this like the real 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 nice way the proper way the mathematician's way um so that would probably work i don't think i'll take the time to implement this on this stream but because i'd rather make some actual editor functionality but yeah that's probably a viable approach actually so i think what i will do instead is i will do something like find the nearest tile i've hovered over so it would be nice to be able to take um, certain screen position, right? Um, 
this is something I need to account for as well. Um, let's give myself a camera position. I'm going to say camera position is equal to The reason I'm doing this is I'm sort of offsetting stuff to like center this on the screen and I if I'm going to figure out mouse coordinates and what tile I'm hovering over I need to uh, account for that so I'm just saving that sort of offset in a variable here as well. So um, I'm going to sort of undo the effect of the camera, if you like. Um, so if I'm at zero, zero, I'm actually at less than that. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I believe that's great. Okay. So... Going back to what I had before, the way I figured out a position was that every time we move along the x-axis we add this particular offset, which kind of corresponds to moving like right and down, so we like visually align with the tile, and I've got these little stride variables which kind of keep track of how to move from one tile to the next. So I probably need to do something like an inverse of that um, in order to account for mouse right so I know that Ooh. so let's say with the mouse at like MX and MY so I know that and I'm trying to find the actual like tile X and tile Y so I know that um, So TX times X stride. Okay, let's call this like stride X, stride Y, stride X equal to mouse X tile Y times stride Y equal to that's why, so I've got a couple of equations for these things, so I can um, like rearrange these, right? So if I want to find the tile x, I'm going to do yeah, x is equal to yeah, so this is a vector and this is a uh, these are vectors, it's just a scalar. Okay, what's the best way to do this? Yeah. So this is like not super, super trivial. Let me have a little second to think here. So it's kind of hard to do algebra and talk at the same time. Um, <laughs> I basically need to solve to find the tile position given the mouse position here. I could kind of cheat and like scan through all of the tiles which are in the world and just figure out each of their positions and then figure out which one is closer. Honestly, that would be <laughs> totally fine and, and that would definitely work. That's kind of what I described with my like kind of cheating method. This would actually give me an accurate like final result. So what I'm actually doing is the real nice method, I suppose. Um, 
Okay, this is something where I draw this out on paper and kind of doing that on screen is not too convenient, so I'm gonna just just cheat here. Okay. Um okay. I'm figuring out what I want to name these variables. I spent far too long agonizing over this kind of thing. Um, looks like the projected positions, okay. Um, because it's going to be convenient. same little bit of logic so I'm gonna pull this out to another function so we can reuse it I can just say turn that at the square root. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm figuring out their mouse's position. I'm then going through every tile in the world. I'm calculating its position. I'm calculating its distance from the mouse position. And then if it's within, if it's the closest one so far, I'm sort of rem remembering that. Um, we probably want a sort of threshold for this. So, you know, if we're too far away, then we're not going to let this happen. Um, let's say like 32. Say if the distance is less than or equal to if we're within half the tile's height, then we're gonna return. Return null because we're not really near any tile at all. Um, okay, let's find out. The 
hop at the tile. Look that up in those positions, and now let's just do something to highlight it. So let's say if the tile is not null, it could be null if you're not hovering over anything, and and our you know if we are the hover tile, meaning that our x and y coordinates match whatever it's being hovered. And I'm going to do a tint uh, in red, a bit arbitrarily, otherwise I'm going to kind of not tint it, which is equivalent to tinting it in white. Tint is like a multiply blend, if you like. Um, yeah. So we're going to kind of highlight the hover tile. bracket so my indentation is probably out. Oh, you know what? I did not close that. Whoop. So format please. So the hover tile I return is not an object with XY, it's just a little array which I'm just putting two elements into like that as a way to have like an integer coordinate if you like. Ha! Huh. Would you look at that? It appears to be working. So yeah, you can see as I get on the boundary this is actually not super accurate. It's also not totally centered just due to the way the sprite is kind of set up, but this is perfectly fine. For me right now, I mean actually yeah, interacting with this is actually kind of fine. Um I'm very much able to like point to whatever tile I like. So now let's do something where um maybe if I use the scroll wheel, we're gonna like scroll through the different tiles and we can use that to effectively draw the world. So how do I check the scroll wheel in processing? Mouse wheel? Code of the mouse wheel is run when the mouse wheel is moved. Get count. Returns positive when it's rotated up and negative when it's rotated down. Okay, so we can use this to kind of scroll through the tile indexes, I think. So let's create this little function. So the way processing works is that if you define function with particular names, then it will call them automatically in response to certain events. That's how you kind of listen for input. So first of all, we kind of need to figure out if we're hovering over anything. If not, then we can just bail out now. Nothing reasonably we can do there. Otherwise, if... What's that syntax again? Oh, okay. Processing doesn't normally use these, it normally just sets some globals, but okay. If the event count. Okay, you know what? So I can say equals the current index, which is going to be
which is kind of a horrible brackety expression here, but um, <laughs> this is the y coordinate or the second thing in this little array, and then the x coordinate is here. There's that tile index, so we're going to just add this count, which kind of counts how many ticks of the scroll wheel you've done. Um, and then I need to make sure it doesn't um, go too high or too low, right? It can't go below zero and it can't go above the number of available tiles. And for that I can use the handy modulus operator. Um, should do what we need. And I'm going to write that back in. So. Okay, maybe a little bug there, but what this should hopefully allow me to do is go around the world and then cause a problem. <laughs> okay, I bet it's because I went below zero if I scroll the other way. But this will work, yeah. So I can scroll through all these things. If I scroll below zero. do something here to account for that. Yeah, this little modulus trick kind of only working if I put the number too high. If I put it below zero, it leaves it below zero. So. Okay. So I can now <laughs> kind of build a world here. Awesome. I would, I'd call this successful. It's actually kind of fun. Um, uh, maybe as a last thing, I'll just quickly allow um, make this world bigger and allow like moving around it with the arrow keys or something like that. So let's say, you know, what? finding out if a key is being held is actually really annoying in this in processing. Um, it doesn't give you a function off the bat. To tell you, yeah, it turned out pretty good, right? It's actually kind of usable and aesthetically looks pretty nice. I think what I'll do is. Okay, I want to kind of brush this, but. Um... Yeah, it will tell you when a key is pressed and when a key is released, but if you want to keep track of. If a key's being held right now, you kind of need to do that yourself, like introduce some variables to do that. So I could add variables for each of the arrow keys, or I could do something like... So there's a key variable, right? Is it an integer? Let me look up the documentation again. Key. Okay, so key happens if it's a character on the keyboard. Key code, I think, is used for like arrow keys and stuff like that. Yeah, you have to do this. This is real janky, honestly. It's one of the things I like least about processing. But what I can do is... Is it an integer? Will it even tell me the type of this? Okay, Belief, take care, thanks for stopping by. So I'm going to do something like this. So if the key is coded, then it means it's like a arrow key or some kind of function key. And then what I can have here is like a... something like this. It's 
this is going to work. Yeah, then I can probably just say um, these dot. What is it? Add. Hopefully that makes sense. So I'm using this little set to keep track of all the keys I've got pressed. When something's pressed, I'm going to add it. When something's released. I'm going to remove it. So now I've got a little tracker. Honestly, processing should just do this for you, but this is something you kind of have to write yourself. But it means I can now, in our update, I can do something like if um, what's the syntax again? So if you're holding the up key, I'm going to say Camera controller like this. Need to import that. Okay, all my arrows are backwards. <laughs> my signs are the wrong way around. Honestly, I, I never spend the mental bandwidth to figure this out. I just put it arbitrarily, and then if it's back to front, I just switch it. I'm more or less happy with doing that. Okay, so I can now scroll this around with the arrow keys. So let's make the world bigger. Start with a world full of grass and now I can... God, this is really like one of the theme park games or something. What was it called? Theme Park Tycoon? I forget the actual name of it. Okay, we can now make our little <laughs> our little world here. As we see fit. We can spend all our days crafting beautiful rivers with random pointy spikes in them. Yeah. So there we go. This is kind of rough, but we've got the basic rendering down. We have hacked together some basic sort of uh, user input. This could definitely be optimized. I kind of feel bad that I cheated in terms of um, how I figure out which tile I'm hovering over rather than actually solving the system of equations to figure out that correctly. But you know, this is not a math stream and I don't really want to do that in an image editing program. I would I would get out some actual paper for this. Um, so as it is now, I'm kind of pleased with where this is at. It does the job. And honestly, sometimes it's not worth spending the time to actually optimize things and do them properly if you know that they're not going to be used in any sort of performance critical section of the code, right? Um, I'd rather just write brute force like naive solution that I know is always going to work than spend even 30 minutes like figuring out uh, the mathematical niceties of how to do it kind of properly. Ooh. Oh, didn't really
realize processing would let me resize the window. Cool. So I could build a whole world like this. I could load more tiles and, and stuff into the sheet. Uh, and maybe I'll do that. Maybe before I share the code, I'll like load some more stuff in here. I'll be sure to credit Kenny as well, who created this tile set. Um, yeah, that is it, as it is for now. I think we've got our little isometric world building thing up and running, like kind of surprisingly quickly. Um, I think we'll, we'll call it a day there. So thanks so much, everyone, for watching. Um, if you follow our Twitter, which I will drop a link to here, then every week, kind of before these streams, the day before or a couple of days before we post a poll um, where people can vote for the topics. And you can also suggest topics for me to add to that poll, like somebody on Reddit just suggested I make an isometric renderer, so that's what I've done here. Um, yeah, always open to suggestions or just your kind of feedback on the poll. But thanks so much everyone for tuning in. I will hopefully catch you next, next, next week. Um, I'm not sure totally what we're going to be doing over the kind of holiday period. I'm sure we'll have a little week or two off in there somewhere, but I will keep you guys updated about that. And if you want to stay really updated, our Discord is probably the best place for that. Um, yeah, please check out our Discord. We post announcements of all these things when they happen and all of the other stuff like Steamhounds, which we're working on. So yeah, I think I'll call it there. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye.